Hello everyone, I'm Kevin, by the way, someone's forum, BX257, here to bring you another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review, and today I'll be taking a look at the G.I. Joe's remote control fast attack vehicle, the 1987 Crossfire, and its driver, Rumbler. Neither the Crossfire nor Rumbler make any uh, cartoon appearances, but the vehicle alone makes its first comic book appearance in the old Marvel comic run of G.I. Joe, in issue number 131, where it's actually used as a driverless remote controlled vehicle. And as such, Rumbler makes no comic book appearances, which is a little bit confusing because the 1988 Rolling Thunder vehicle, whose driver was supposed to be named Armadillo, was actually called Rumbler throughout his comic book appearances rather confusingly, but they are two separate characters. Taking a look at the Crossfire vehicle first, you can see that this is how it scales to a three and three quarter inch figure. And even though this is supposed to be armored and very well armed, it's still a dune buggy and I still think it's rather large for a dune buggy. But I believe one of the reasons for that is that this thing is built on a one to 16 scale uh, RC platform, whereas three and three quarter inch figures are one to 18 scale. But that's something that I'll get into a bit later. Just take a look at the toy properties of the Crossfire first. You can see it has balloon front tires, which are rubbery and air filled. Again, that's more of an RC thing, but it's actually kind of interesting. We have a uh, off-road tires, again, rubbery and air-filled. On the front, before the fenders, we have these swiveling machine guns. They swivel all the way around, and they're on both sides as well. And on the side slats, we have foot pegs for at least one figure. Again, on both sides. And in addition to that, we have this large raised platform on the back with two foot pegs. And that's meant for figures to be manning this large cannon at the back. The cannon swivels all the way around. If you uh, get the antenna out of the way, it swivels all the way around. And of course it moves up and down as well. There are no ratchets here, which unfortunately makes this um, a bit floppy if you use it up a little bit. I'm sure you can strengthen that up with something, but it, it, this tends to be a bit floppy after a while. Very interestingly enough, we have two handholds on either side, almost as if one barrel is supposed to be manned each. I'm not really sure about that. The strange thing is, is that it's actually shown for this to be a foot peg for one figure and a foot peg for another figure standing over here. Even though a single figure can actually fit on here. Um, just using both footholds, which I think is a better option to do, even though it, it's technically made for two figures on this large platform. One very interesting thing about the, the cannon is the sights. Again, we have two of these uh, sights on either side. I'm still not quite sure how that works, how, you know, a single thing should be manned by, like, two people at the same time. But this is actually a separate piece. So this thing is something that which can pop off on either side of the spoiler. We have two removable rockets. Just fit on there with the standard G.I. Joe dumbbell peg, which is very unusual seeing as this is not entirely made by Hasbro. But we have two of these rockets. They were unique to the crossfire and never used again, unfortunately. And we have room for one driver. The driver doesn't actually sit very, um, very deeply in there, despite the whole armored front slot thing here. And these, uh, they, look, they almost look like some type of a shoulder harness, but the figure actually just kind of pokes his head through here. And you can't remove this, so there isn't quite a lot of space to actually put the figure in. You kind of have to squeeze the figure in. I'll, I'll show you that right now. I've already put uh, the driver in basically his uh, sitting driving position. Uh, 
and then you squeeze the figure in there. And then you have to squeeze the figure underneath these tines. It's really, it's, it's really kind of nerve-wracking because I tend to think that I'm going to actually crack these things, even though they're they're quite hard and they're a little bit flexible as well. It's still not really an ideal way of putting a figure into a 30-year-old vehicle, just stressing the plastic like that. And here I've put my favorite figure to man the back cannon of the Crossfire, Fast Draw. And as you can see, this looks quite a bit more reasonable with a single figure manning that uh, cannon rather than two at either side. And now to go over the radio control features of the vehicle. And one of them is that there is a different version. Not a variant, but a version. And they were sold alongside each other. And you can see that my version is actually marked Alpha 27. These are all just stickers, of course. But there is a different version called Delta 49. And what that means is that the 27 simply means that that's the megahertz range that the uh, remote is responding to. 49 being 49 megahertz. So you could actually buy two of these and race them against each other. Uh, it's actually fairly clever that they, um, they didn't just put some generic G.I. Joe logo on here. They actually indicated very cleverly which megahertz range that your um, transmitter is responding to. Of course, on the side here, we have the on-off switch. Mine is red on this version. Some versions are black. I'm not quite sure why they changed the color. Some people had, I think, thought that red was only for 27 and black was only for 49, but I've seen it the other way around as well. It's very strange. We also have a recharging port here. The set did not come with a, any type of recharging device, unfortunately, but it was the standard voltage that you can get at any hobby store anyway. Of course, that would depend on whether, you, whether or not you had uh, rechargeable batteries installed. So on the bottom here, we have the, the uh, front wheel steering alignment as well as a latch. Just move that to the side and you can open up this thing. And you can see it takes six AA batteries in a very strange uh, arrangement with the five being this way and a single one being the other way. I think that's just because it's so uh, narrow at the top there. You can see this thing is marked 1987 Hasbro made in Japan. So while this thing is marked made in Has uh, made for Hasbro, it's actually made by Nico. So this is the standard frame buggy, uh, I guess an economy version of the, the Nico frame buggy uh, RC platform. And while I do say economy, it's actually just the platform itself. The actual motor and functions are actually quite high end for its time. And uh, while it might have retailed for around $35 on the cheap, at the highest end it retailed for around $70. Yes, $70. But there's a reason for that, and that's, like I said, because this thing was actually quite, um, quite full of rather a responsive uh, motor as well as transmission. So, you know, you do have your steerable wheels as well as working shocks, both on the front and on the back. These are all metal, full metal rods as well. They're not plastic, they're actually metal. And of course we have this little, uh, whoops, this antenna on the side here. And on the back of the vehicle, we have a switch between power and high speed. Basically, you want power speed on rough terrain and high speed on really smooth, flat surfaces. So you can just... Anyway, taking a look at the remote. This is a full function vehicle. So you have your, well, you have your neutral when you're not touching the, the controls. 
The uh, controls are, of course, uh, very heavy and spring-loaded. Again, this is still quite astonishing to me as this thing is 30 years old, but it's incredibly responsive and incredibly well-built as well. So it's a very solid little, little uh, remote control. Forward, your reverse, your, your left and right. On the back, we have the uh, battery cover. I know you all want to see that because this is one of the things which seem to go missing on remote controls so often. I don't really know why, but um, anyway, we, this thing is powered by a single 9 volt battery. So that's the last battery that you'll need to power this thing. Again, it's made in Japan. The actual antenna for this guy is, well, metal. Again, this is kind of standard. One very interesting thing that I found out when I was doing research on RC vehicles is the fact that uh, the FCC code, if it ends with an H, then this would have been a 49 megahertz transmitter. If it has no, no letter at the end, it's 27. So if you don't have indicators like this or any type of any type of uh, like sticker indicating the megahertz range, you can tell that by the FCC code, either on the remote or on the vehicle itself. And just to compare the Crossfire with the G.I. Joe's more popular dune buggy, the 1985 Aw Striker. With its driver crankcase, as you can see there's a lot of similarities here in both the color, the overall shape, because well, dune buggy, and there's even a bit of a similarity between the figures themselves. So what would the opposite number for the Crossfire be on the Cobra side? Well, as I keep mentioning, this thing is rather oversized for what it's supposed to be. And even though Cobra never got a, an actual radio-controlled vehicle, at least not during the vintage years, I tend to think that uh, 1986 Stun makes a very good opposite number. Not only is it supposed to be a very lightly armored vehicle and sort of a, I guess, a tricycle type design, it's actually quite large as well. And now it's time to find out whether does a modern figure fit in it? As usual, I'll be using my 2009 Rise of Cobra figure as an example of a modern figure. And I can already tell you that the figure will probably not fit in here. It's a... Uh, a very cramped fit, and getting him between these times is pretty much impossible. He is just too bulky, especially with this vest on. As you can see, I've actually taken the vest off, and while it does look like he ought to fit in here, he's still a little bit too bulky. You have to understand that this thing is mostly the problem of this harness on the top. If you could remove that harness, or if you just didn't have the harness on here at all, I'm sure the figure would fit quite nicely. But as such, a modern figure just doesn't really squeeze into there with it on. And now we'll take a look at Rumbler. Take a look at his accessories first. He came with a very nice looking submachine gun. You notice that it is the same mold as the one that came with the 1985 Heavy Metal, driver of the MBT Mahler motorized tank. Except that was in black, and this is in gray. It also has the same problems, such as the extremely thin strap, which is, as you can see, is already um, the plastic is already straining. So this thing is very often just cracked completely off. It's not something I particularly like, to be perfectly honest. He also comes with a removable helmet, and this is something which is actually very um, contentious in the world of G.I. Joe collecting because this, well, it's molded on the same thing as the 1985 Awestriker's crankcase's helmet. It's in brown. But this is exactly the same brown plastic which was found in the Balgear Accessory Pack number 5. And I actually have that here. A lot of collectors will say that, oh yeah, this has a slightly different shade or or the marks on the inside are different. No, no they're not. So here, I have Battle Gear Accessory Pack number 5. It's all, it's all loose here. And here is the helmet. 
And here is Rumbler's helmet, and they are exactly the same. I think they were just made in the same factory. And of course, pack number five was made in 1987. So it wouldn't surprise me if these actually did come from the same mold, and they just overdid one of the molds just to distribute to the Rumbler figure. That just makes a bit more, you know, economical sense from a factory a production standpoint. The other nice thing about accessory pack number five is that it comes with a lot of really dark gray weapons which to be honest like this Uzi this is the type of Uzi I actually like posing this figure with when he's not posed inside of the uh, vehicle driving but you can see it actually goes with the gray of his shirt quite a bit better than the slightly lighter gray that just uh, is nowhere near on you know nowhere near the color of his of his body so it actually makes for a better display if you're putting him with the reissue weapons for some strange reason and as for the figure himself well he is made up of entirely of used parts his head is from footloose his chest and arms are from the aforementioned 1985 heavy metal figure and his waist and legs are from 1985 bazooka so he is entirely made up of 1985 figure parts but I do have to say that despite the fact that he is a figure from you know 1987 and things were getting a bit strange in the color and sculpting department I'm I'm actually quite pleased with how this figure actually turns out with this uh, mostly subdued color scheme like his pants could be a bit more on the tan dull side rather than this sort of um, pudding color but still, it's a very nice color scheme. It's a very nice, well, sort of desert color scheme, which is also very strange for a jungle-colored vehicle that he goes with. But still, it's all very military, and he looks great with his helmet, which, like I said, you can pick up with um, Battle Gear Accessory in a pack number five, and you really don't have to worry about trying to find a figure on the aftermarket. About the only unique things is the weapon, which is... Unfortunately, quite a quite a hard catch to find. While Rumbler used Bazooka's leg mold, the reverse was also true. In 1988, when Bazooka was offered as a mail-away, a small run of new figures were made to meet demand. So some mail-away Bazooka figures carry a 1987 stamp on the leg from Rumbler's mold use instead of the original 1985 stamp. Rumbler was also made available through the 1992 Hasbro G.I. Joe convention, but this figure came with the common 1989 recoils weapons and no helmet, instead of his rare original accessory. If you're looking for a crossfire on the aftermarket, there are quite a number of things that you have to look out for in order to make one that's actually complete, never mind a working RC car. Of course, the uh, cannon and the, the missiles are all things that, which pop off and are often missing. The entire figure is often missing and you have to find him complete on top of that. But more than that, the front bumper is actually a very fragile piece. I'm not quite sure why that is. It's actually fairly thin. And like I said, this thing was actually based on the economy version of the frame buggy um, the line of Nico vehicles. So if you're looking for one on the aftermarket and you might think of swapping the electronics or something or swapping out the bumper because the bumper is actually a separate piece. You can actually swap the bumper out entirely. What I would suggest is looking for a Nico Excalibur. Excaliburs are quite a bit easier to find as these are made in Korea and in quite a bit uh, larger numbers than the Japanese made Crossfire. So there's quite a bit more of these on the aftermarket. And what I do is I've actually popped off the bumper and the bumper, even though they're, they're swappable, these things are made of a much more robust material. It's quite a bit more of a relief to dr actually drive this thing with a more robust bumper than the original one, which is very often shatterable. Be sure to check out the 3D Joe's website page on the Crossfire, which includes a short interview with the toy creators.
G.I. Joe Tour Review at the Uncle Ben. This episode is brought to you by Bridgestone. Bridgestone, maker of little radio-controlled toy tires that last longer than actual automobile tires. Go figure. The other, more famous G.I. Joe Boon Badoom Bip. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.